Hello everybody, I'm John Bruin, Chief Executive of Knox Healthcare. You're very welcome to our chat pod and um, sometimes referred to as pod chat. And um, today we're talking about uh, just and restorative cultures. And you might be thinking, oh, what nurse this? I've got uh, a brilliant um, collection of people on our um, chat pod today um, that's going to go through um, what it is for, for each of us. And it doesn't matter that it's a little bit different, but the key thing is why it's so important. And um, one of the questions might be, um, what is it, what does it mean to you? So I'm going to kick off with just a few thoughts about just restorative cultures. So um, from my perspective, um, we're a, we're a large organisation of over 9,000 staff and volunteers and our work environments are, are critical, critical areas. And when we come to work as individuals and within teams and part of a larger organisation, it's really important to have an environment and an atmosphere where people feel able to contribute. So um, it's an inclusive environment, but and by that are able to contribute to how work works, how things can improve, identifying when things aren't going so well, and more importantly, learn to do things better and improve so that at the end of the day, the reason we're all here is to um, ensure that patients, service users, carers get a good deal and have good experiences and um, can flourish. And we need to create environments where staff can do the same. And sometimes in organisations, because we're essentially a human organisation, um, environments and cultures can get a bit um, bogged down, a bit irritable for all sorts of reasons, never really due to one thing. And my view was that uh, Knox Healthcare, for multiple reasons over um, a few years, it got itself into a particular place where people were quick to respond, grievances were high, there were lots of um, difficult conversations, and um, we got ourselves mired in what I think were quite poor work cultures. And this programme is part of. Um, restoring environments where people are able to speak up, contribute, feel that they're making a difference. Um, and these are all really important values and behaviours that have been identified by all our staff across the organisation when we did a, a diagnostic on it a year or two back. So I'm really excited about having a, a great conversation this afternoon. Um, and we're going to go around in turn and introduce a couple of topics. And first of all, I'm going to hand over to Jen Gwyber. Jen, over to you. Thank you very much, John. Um, so I'm Jen Guiva. I'm Deputy Director of People and Culture. I'm relatively new to the organisation. I started with the Trust in January, um, so just over six months, and um, still playing the new card. Um, in terms of what just a restorative culture um, means to me, um, I want to focus really around um, enabling our leaders um, to make this organisation a really great place to work, because as John said, the organisation is not about four walls, definitely not in this case. It's about the people um, who provide excellent care to our patients. And in the case of my team, do a lot of things behind the scenes to make that happen. Um, so for me, it's about um, our people and culture team providing a leadership environment and tools and training policies um, where leaders can um, make person centred decisions, I guess. Um, so when you're looking at your sickness policy, you're actually looking at Jen, who's been off sick with whatever condition and not just blindly following a process. It's about looking at the person in front of you and making decisions related to that person. Um, but secondly, um, doing things the right way rather than doing things right. Um, so having um, people practices across the organisation where um, we do the right thing um, again rather than following processes to the letter that might not take into account people's individual circumstances. I think I'm passing on to Fiona next. Hello everyone, I'm Fiona Rillingsworth and I'm the Associate Director of Quality in the Trust. Um, one of my main areas of responsibility really 
falls around patient safety and many of you will know that often means we we conduct many many investigations following serious incidents and my take on all of this is most people don't come to work to actually deliberately cause harm to anybody but sometimes things happen the circumstances there's lots of reasons and factors why people either make decisions they make or act in the way that they do so i really sort of feel this is really about um it's about the right way to treat people and we haven't always got that right in the past and i think it's a really good opportunity to kind of reset the bar on that and really sort of consider how we treat people sort of when things have gone wrong because ultimately they do go wrong but it's not necessarily because people as i've said do anything wrong deliberately. I think also we've spoken about just culture for a really, really long time. But for me, the real step change here for us is that restorative bit, because I think what we need to be doing is restoring that sort of trust and respect at all sort of levels within the organisation, whether that's about individual people, whether it's about actually that um, trust and respect within teams, because I think that's where things really sort of do start to fall down. So that's, I suppose, my take about what this means to me. I'm going to hand over to Angela. Thank you. So um, a just and restorative culture to me is a culture where um, we can make mistakes and people are able to feel that they can own up to them. Um, so it's a, uh, the just bit is it's about not wanting a mistake has happened and what not wanting retribution i.e to punish the person that's made up made the mistake so the biggest focus will be on learning from the mistakes or near misses that we have and how we um approach that um so as so I'm an impact case manager, I forgot to say that um, in the day job, but I'm also a co-chair of the BME staff network, which I've been doing since 2017. And so for me, a big thing about a just and restorative culture is having cultural intelligence, um, like what Jen said about being person centred. But I think as an organisation, we still got to say what we feel is acceptable and what is not acceptable and I think the problem in the past has been those grey areas in between where they've not gone to you know formal disciplinary and those informal so that everybody gets um, consistent outcomes so um, really interested in from a network point of view about engagement um, from the organisation and um, psychological safety and I agree with Fiona about the what happens when if somebody does go through formal um, that um, there's no case to answer about how you reintegrate that practitioner so a big focus on a just and restorative culture is who was hurt and that can be if it's a patient safety incident it can be the patient but it's also the team around that and if that person then resumes going back to work, how we deal with the fallout of that process. Because I think in the past, people have gone through formal procedures, no action has been taken, but then you're left with lots of people who have been hurt by the processes. And hopefully that will filter through to some of our processes and policies, which Jen talked about. And I think that's uh, over to Alex now. Thanks so much. I'm um, Alex Lyon. I'm Culture and Engagement Manager, and I just couldn't agree more with everything that everybody said. Um, we've been looking at just a restorative culture for a while across the organisation, and um, we've come up with a, a definition which um, um, a few people have, have um, talked about, which is really, which is stated that within our organisation, a just and restorative culture means acting with compassion, treating people fairly and justly and embracing a learning culture where if something goes wrong, we seek first to understand. It is an ethos by which we are all accountable for our actions. We act in line with and recruit to our trust values and we assume positive intent during our interactions. And um, you know, I'm not eloquent enough to be able to say off the cuff so anything better than that, but I do, I'm absolutely passionate 
about the elements with regards to psychological safety within teams and um and this absolutely as john said it links to very much to um freedom to speak up to to speaking up but people unless they're feeling psychologically safe within their teams with their manager and with their uh, within the organization they're not going to feel safe to speak up um and um and very much really linking about um thinking about and and linking to um you know really re responding to errors as has been said but also about staff support and the support that's there not only when something goes wrong, but throughout somebody's employment um, within the organisation from day one, how we're supporting them and seeing them as an individual. Um, and um, thinking about civility and respect as well. So really just being kind and, you know, and, and treating people as you would want to be treated yourself and just be, you know, um, and we've, we do, there's a lot of work and there's a lot of evidence about what happens when um, there's incivility in the, in the workplace and it's, it's, it's scary. So really wanting to make sure that that's a part of, of how we're treating each other. Um, and then, as, al as already been said, really looking at um, equality, diversity and inclusion being absolutely paramount to everything that we're doing across the organisation as well. Um, but that's that's my take, really, um, with thanks to a lot of people that have helped contribute to the to what's um, the definition. But over to Karen. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Hampson. I'm a service manager for the Mental Health Service Older People Directorate. And I've been a service manager for 10 years now. So I've been managing staff for kind of a long time um, uh, on the front line. And I'm really, really passionate about supporting staff. Um, you know, over the years, you know, I, I've kind of listened to many staff. I've heard many staff, I've, uh, you know, I, and I'm, I'm so passionate about it, which is why I went on the course um, a few years ago for just, you know, to look at the just and restorative culture. Um, and I suppose for me, you know, what what I, I firmly believe that nobody comes to work to do a bad job and that everybody comes to work to do their best um, for the patients and uh, and their colleagues. But sometimes systems and processes and and, and things get in the way um, of, of things, uh, you know, people find workarounds and all sorts of different things. Um, so I feel that, you know, um, you know, it's about uh, just a restorative culture to me is about uh, feeling safe to speak up, being listened to, feeling supported, and being no know, know, knowing that I would be treated fairly. Um, you know, and that the systems and processes, the policies and procedures that are in place within this organisation um, have my best interests at heart and that I will be treated compassionately and kindly, you know, um, should anything happen. Um, it also means to me that it's a learning environment rather than an environment where blame is cast, um, you know, and that actually you're innocent until you're proven guilty rather than the other way around. Um, and that actually it's an organisation, you know, uh, uh, where, where, our behaviours really matter and that we're all accountable for the way we treat each other and that that's important and that's in, and it should be important to every single one of us. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's my take on it. It's fab. It's, it's so good. It's so good just having this kind of conversation. And I think that's something that I, I'd say it would be really good if throughout the whole organization we could be just just taking a little bit of time to talk about uh, what a just and restorative culture actually means for us um because I, I i i've immediately found myself um just sort of in my head kind of responding to some of those comments i think for me there's something about um to 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 bring it to the personal to actually be thinking very deliberately for myself about how I'm acting. Um, so, for example, you know, being being really deliberate about thinking, OK, what would me being compassionate mean today uh, in whatever the environment is that I'm in? And I find that 
is a useful way for me to kind of just re ground myself in whatever it is that we're talking about and to think very actively about uh, what it is I'm trying to do with just an restorative culture. And I think the, the an example I'd give is around the equality, diversity, inclusion uh, angle. And as others have, others have said, it's a really important piece. Over the last 18 months, we have rightly been uh, trying to focus some of our work uh, around uh, racism within both the trust and also uh, within society. We've seen it um, particularly, uh, we've had a particular spotlight through the pandemic. Um, we've also had a particular spotlight in terms of Black Lives Matter and the murder of George Floyd. And, you know, I, I think part of what it's done for me in terms of the just and restorative culture piece is that um, I've found it helpful to from time to time think very deliberately about my white privilege and also the privilege that comes from the position that I hold as trust chair um, you know and I think it's really important for me to be able to keep reminding myself of those issues within the equality diversity and inclusion part of this um, because that impacts on how I interact with others throughout the organization um, and I do think there's something that um, I'll, 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 I will attribute it appropriately to, to Anne-Maria Anne -Maria Newham um, who has a phrase along the lines of when when something's happened that's not gone as we wanted it to actually asking a more strategic question about what did we do or not do as an organization or as leaders that enabled this situation to have occurred and i think from a board perspective that's a really helpful thing for us to be doing so if something has gone wrong um, that actually we take time in the midst of looking at all of that to say what did we put in place that actually meant this happened and I think that's why it's important that John was reflecting on kind of where we'd come from as an organization but let's let's move it on a little bit if we can and just if I could just ask you to to perhaps try and identify each of you just one thing that if we were getting this right what would be one of the measures that you would think ah oh, this would be telling me that we were getting our just and restorative culture right if that makes sense as a question um so uh, somebody somebody give me a wave if you're up for having a go at give it, giving me an answer on that um who's who's, who's going to go first on that angela thank you um so uh, so if if we were getting just and restorative culture right angela um what what would be one measure that you think this would tell you that we were getting it right? Oh, just one. Um, just the one. <laughs> um, I, I think um, I think the one that I'd probably go for then is uh, an in an increase in um, or a decrease in um, or an improvement in retention figures for staff um sort of leaving the the trust um and i'm not sure if we still sort of analyze um reasons for people leaving but it might be that they're they're not leaving the organization that they're, they're leaving for for better and and bigger things and uh, that's not a reason sort of for leaving great so i'll just limit it to the one no, that's that's really that's really good, and I'm sure Jen will uh, will will uh, absolutely tell us that we are doing that. Yes, yeah, so we do. We we report what we call turnover um, to the board in terms of a percentage, uh, but obviously that's only sort of half the story. It's just a data bit of data, and um, but we can analyse um, leaving reasons and exit interviews. I think probably we could do more around that to really have. Um, quite high quality exit interviews perhaps with someone from outside of people's areas I think that's something I'd like to look at um in terms of a measure for me I'm just going to go with my um HR background and say um less grievances um less grievances um in terms of and I think the reason for that is um that would show that people um are resolving things in a different way and not feeling that they need to use a formal process um 
and that would I think that would show a really a real shift in culture um, not to say that people aren't aggrieved people will continue to be aggrieved but there's a probably a healthier and more um, a happier way to um, resolve our grievances with each other. True. Karen, Karen's got a hand up. Karen. Yeah, because I, I, I was wondering whether um, sickness uh, might be a, a, a something to look at, and especially sickness with regard to staff going off um, if they're being investigated for any reason. Um, you know, because obviously, you know, we do, you know, when 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 a member of staff, um, you know, knows that they're under investigation, I think how we manage that, if we can manage that in a compassionate, kind, supportive way, you know, we can support somebody to stay at work, um, you know, rather than and then to go off sick. So I just wondered whether that might be something we might look at. That sounds good. Fiona? Yeah, I think my measure would be that actually we've got fewer investigations and that we only actually are investigating when we know there's a real opportunity to learn. And I think that's something that could be measurable. I think we need to be able to evidence that where we are um, commissioning an investigation, whether it's in response to um, a serious incident or a grievance or whatever, that there's a real evidence base behind the, the rationale to do that and that staff themselves feel that they've been treated equally that no matter the manager the actual decision to to commission that investigation would be the same no matter what the circumstances were or no matter what the manager was fab alex no um i suppose it, for me it's um linked as well to to making sure that um those people in the investigations that we are doing from an employee relations perspective um are absolutely um that we we've gone through the right process to make sure that everything else could that could have been done and investigated first and that we're really um looking at, at uh, where something has deliberately been done and we're focused on those investigations um so people are held to account because um, for me it's not about letting people off the hook um, where something has been done deliberately but it's making sure that actually we're just looking at where things have been de done deliberately rather than because systems were at fault because there were things within the trust that we haven't got right first um, and therefore um, because um, yeah so that that's what it is really about just making mm -hmm. sure that, that the investigations that we are doing are the, are the right ones that have gone yeah. forward. Thanks, Angela. Do you want to do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I think it, I think it's linking to that. I agree about a reduction in investigations, but I just think it's about part of the restorative and just culture is uh, seeking to understand is like the first step. So there's a pause before we actually jump into formal and explore whether we can deal with things in other ways than straight to, and it links into what Fiona says in terms of serious incidents, whether we seek to understand first, which should in turn bring down formal investigations in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Karen. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I agree uh, with Angela uh, on that. Um, you know, and I just, I was just thinking um, as she was speaking, you know, that if there was greater autonomy to deal with things um, at a local level, um, you know, rather than escalating to an investigation, um, you know, that would certainly kind of bring bring those figures down. Mm, yeah, and I think we do, we do need to work at making sure we've put in place what we need to to support our managers to be able to feel confident at doing that. Jen, have, have a comment and then John, um, I, I realise I've just fallen into um, pretending I'm actually chairing this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm think gonna... really right. So, Jen. It's, it's related. So, um, just from restorative culture, as Alex said, doesn't mean that we're never going to investigate anything and there's never going to be any disciplinary action because people do do silly things or deliberate things. It's a very small percentage. I agree with Karen, the vast majority of people come to work to do an amazing job. But when people do find themselves in that situation, a just and restorative way to deal with that is to make sure that they are supported through that process and not only them, um, but witnesses. Um, 
And those witnesses can be right up to really senior people who you think, oh, well, they don't need any support, but they may be very senior, but they may never have been to an employment tribunal, for example. Or I found myself in coroner's court and that was a completely different situation than I'd ever been in and not one I would ever want to do again. Um, so having support when people um, are in those situations, we're making some improvements and I, I think we've got a little way to go with that. But that is the when things do go wrong and an investigation has to happen, let's do it in the right way as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John, I won't start telling the story about when I did actually appear in a Crown Court many decades ago, but um, I'll hand across to you um, and uh, just get some reflections from you. You're still wearing the tag, I think, Paul, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so my, my, my um, um, observation is probably, uh, uh, um, a bit more difficult to measure and I think it's um, so it comes from when cultures aren't working well and um, people and teams get very defensive and it's very much there's nothing to see here it's all fine um, and um, there's a sense that you can't go wrong you've got to have a hand on everything and get it sorted so as you start to restore your culture and improve there's more an openness and an okayness about saying, I need a bit of help here, or it's okay to say, I'm not okay, or it's okay to say, yeah. help, I'm not quite sure what to do. And if, if we can develop that culture, particularly within our, our managers and senior managers, that um, Jen mentioned it right at the start about pro providing people with the appropriate toolkits and skills to to work in those sorts of rooms, because it can be quite uh, um, a skill to pull that off. Um, you know, if, if you're, you know, you're, you're line managing a group of people and group professionals, so actually I don't know how to do that. Um, leave it with me, I'll come back and we'll, we'll resolve it together. Um, isn't necessarily a natural response in, um, you know, pressured teams. And it's those sorts of things. I'm not saying we should measure it, but, but there's a sense that if, if in organisations and teams where that's that's working, you get the sorts of cultures that that we're aiming to get to. Um, so that's 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 my take on that. Um, I'm going to hand back to you, Paul, because I think we're, um, unless there's anything else you want to add, we're on to the next bit now. I was, uh, I, I was thinking perhaps just as a as a, as a sort of a final conversation piece, just to have some reflections about. Um, if if any of you have had thoughts about your own behaviours that you'd want to change, um, and that actually is a, is it is in your mind as actually this is something I want to do um, differently, um, and I mean one one of the things that when I was looking through some of the materials around this um i thought actually i i uh, one of one of the questions that i don't ask often enough is actually asking people what it's like to be on the receiving end of me and i think that that's a really it's one um uh, john i know that it's a question that you you do ask um ab about yourself and i think i think it's a it's a really useful one um, and that's one that for me that I'm going to try and uh, ask ask a bit more frequently. Uh, but yeah, he'll give it. He'll give a response to that about something that you know you're thinking. Actually, this is a behaviour I'm I'm personally wanting to change. Jen, you you start off, and then others chip in. You're on mute, Jen. Um, so my answer is probably twofold because I see myself, I've got the responsibility for actually quite a large people and culture team, um, but I also have a responsibility around creating the people environment of the organisation. Um, so I think for my team, um, I want to make sure that all the decisions we make are person centred um, and respond to individual needs um so you know across our team we'll have all sorts of things going on at any one time organizational change sickness issues long-term ill health but really making sure that the people who are reporting to me are taking a person-centered approach that'd be one thing in terms of um the organization um i i've actually this afternoon spent some time being very challenging about our sickness policy um, and we're doing a rewrite at the moment, so making sure that that um, is written in a supportive way. It's not about punitive action, get rid of 
terminology like warnings. Um, it's about supporting people to either have a better attendance record or find some sort of alternative reasonable adjustments or whatever that might be. So they're my two. Brill, <laughs> who's going to go next? Yeah, I'll go. So um, I think for me, it's um, the I, I just want to <clears throat> to I suppose um, showcase and role model. Um, you know, just being kind and um, and just you know just thinking about uh, as you said that what it's like to be on the receiving end of me, but actually just thinking about um, you know my behaviours to to other people, making sure that that you know there's a big piece of work that's happening across the trust at the moment on closed cultures and making sure that we're open, that we're able to <coughs> um, you know that the, um me and my team you know that that we're open and we're we're really absolutely passionate about making sure that this is replicated across the organization that everybody is that just a restorative culture is the way that we are around the organization that we're living our values and you know that that actually we're trying to demonstrate the link between you know the um if we are showcasing this and if we live our values and we live the you know through a just and restorative lens then actually you know the the impact that that will have on patient care and um a, along with you know the the working lives of our staff is absolutely paramount so it you know it to me it to me it's so simple but it's also so complicated <laughs> yeah. so, no, that's, that's yeah. great thanks alex karen i think you're next yeah, so um, I want to kind of make sure that um, I am that I am compassionate. So in every single interaction, every single conversation that I have with any colleague or member of staff, um, with any of our people, I want to make sure that that's what I am. And um, you know, and again, it kind of touches, I suppose, on what you what we've all been saying about what is it like to be on the receiving end of me. And I and I do. And since doing that course, I, I do reflect on that every night on the way home, um, to be fair. And and I also want to be, um, you know, an active part of, of this kind of group in making sure that we embed compassion in, into all of our policies, procedures and processes, because uh, to me, that's really, really important. Well, I think Fiona and then Angela and then we'll give John a last word, maybe. Fiona. Thank you. I think we've all got a really important part as leaders in the organisation, haven't we, to actually lead the way in this and um, lead by example. And, and I know personally, I just want to be a lot more um, reflective of my decision making and making sure that I am being really, really open and transparent with people. Um, but also I've like Jen, I, I head up quite a large sort of function in the organisation, so we've got um, you know quite a lot of staff, and I think it's how how we, my whole team, sort of act um, with that civility. But so much of this for me is about supporting staff, and I think that's where my team have actually got a lot a lot to offer there, whether it's through um, the patient safety function when it's around investigations or attending inquests whether it's our quality first team actually going in and doing those clinical reviews and working alongside, you know, our frontline clinicians and helping them to understand what good, look, what good looks like and supporting them and to actually also reflect on their practice and their behaviours when they're, when they're doing that as well and sort of leading that through example. I've also got a really good opportunity that we're just currently reviewing our training for um, incident investigations. We've got a great opportunity to actually build in the whole just and restorative culture into that so we can remind people that, you know, all the way through that. And finally, I think it's always remembering that actually in all of this, again, about staff support and sometimes staff are, vic are second victims in some of these situations that go on. And sometimes I think we can forget that and forget the impact of staff and on teams when things haven't quite gone to plan and making sure we're there sort of behind them and supporting them. Thanks. Angela, do you want to give us your, your reflection? Yeah, so so when I started uh, my just and restorative training, I, I was a social work manager at Rampton and I would have said I was trying to uh, role model and bring that approach in, in working with staff and, and sort of um, highlighting that this approach is coming, particularly in terms of um, safeguarding, I would say, and investigations. I suppose in my current role as an impact case manager, it probably aligns with what Fiona says about thinking about a just, 
just a restorative culture because I'm more involved in patient care, patient safety. We have oversight of quality. So all the stuff around closed cultures. And even though I don't like manage staff, I try to um, share the work that I do with the Just and Restorative Culture with both my impact team and also in terms of um, the network. So for for the last couple of years, I have I have been sort of advocating and saying, you know, don't worry, a Just and just Restorative Culture is on its way um, and um, times are changing. So from a network point of view, I've probably tried to be more involved in uh, some of the groups that are looking at some of the sickness policies and advocating for the network to be uh, consulted on some of the um, policies like sickness and grievance and trying to get members of the network as well involved in some of the just and restorative work streams that were, were going ahead. And Alex has come and done a presentation to the network around values, incivility. Um, so that was quite useful because I think different people are at different levels with it, depending on how involved you've been in, in the work. So I was on my training with Karen and Fiona, I think. Great. Thanks, Angela. J John, do you want to wrap things up? Yes. Yeah. So a couple of so a couple of things from me. Um, the, the first is, um, I, I suppose, um, best described as there are two sides to every story. So and, and to continually remind myself of that, you can imagine I get a, a steady stream of emails through my inbox with, um, so I say sometimes a very aggrieved member of staff on the end of it, um, giving chapter and verse about how poorly they've been dealt with and I'm sitting there reading and thinking oh my god what on earth have we done here what's a complete catastrophe how utterly useless are we um, and then needless to say we get the other side of the story and I sort of think oh yeah um, <laughs> the two sides to every story and um, so it's really important I can I, I keep reminding myself of that and not jump into early conclusions decisions or interventions and um, so that there's a there's a more balanced and just response um, and the second thing is a bit about, um, again, personally for me, is to keep reminding myself as I become a more distant a clinician of the past um, and working um, at, the, at the coal face, but not just in clinical services, but a staff right across our really diverse trust, um, a, a daily managing, you know, very difficult challenges, not, you know, notwithstanding COVID and the pandemic. You know whether it's on you know in secure wards, working in prisons, um, being on reception, um, receiving calls, um, working in PALs, and um, so you know whatever people do in transport facilities, it's and there's a whole stack of really difficult stuff that people are managing every day, um, and sometimes in the more rarefied atmosphere of headquarters and the executive team, you can if you're not careful get a bit distance from that. Um, so again, it's a really important part of how I try to manage to keep sighted and real you know, visits and touring around is a really important part of what we do. It's been a bit curtailed and we're really looking forward to getting back to that, to just meeting people and being with them to, to sort of um, re-energise, you know, this is the this is the real work going on more. Um, so that's that's um, that's my take on that, Paul. Um, I'm going to hand back to you and then we can summarise and close. Yeah, thanks. Thanks ever so much for this conversation. And uh, I've, I've just really enjoyed hearing different perspectives that are uh, but are on the same page, if that makes sense. Um, and it's it, it's really good just getting those thoughtful reflections um, from colleagues. Um, and I think it's it's a conversation, as I said at the start, that I hope that um, others watching will think, well, actually, let's take this conversation into, you know, my team, into my my part of the organisation, and just uh, just have that piece of conversation. And certainly um, for myself, uh, and I'm sure for John and our other board colleagues, um, if we when we do get back to being able to do those visits, I'd really really welcome conversations about this as well and getting a bit of challenge from anybody who thinks actually this isn't looking quite right um, so um, yeah very much welcome welcome that so 
thanks very much um, for this chat pod pod chat and um, we'll we'll hopefully see you again on another one at some point soon. Thanks to everybody who's contributed to this one. Good stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. you so much. Thanks, Paul.